When all I see is a mountain, you see a mountain moon. And as I walk through the shadow, your love surrounds me. There's nothing to fear. There's nothing to fear. going to do our scripture reading today as a church, and uh, this time we're going to make sure that the uh, proper translation is on the screen so that we're speaking together. So that's the whole point of this, is we're unified in the scripture memory. And so what you see up there is our scripture verse, John 15, 5, and that's for the later half of September, and so we're going to do that today, together as a church today. So would you all uh, repeat that with me? And so we're going to go, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Amen. It's so encouraging to know that our success and our uh, just doesn't rely on on what we can do, but through Christ and, and him alone. God 
You know, as a kid, uh, I was a weird kid, I think, you know, as most kids kind of are. And I, I remember I, I liked to play with my shadow, if you ever heard of anything like that. Because with your shadows, you could make uh, different pictures in your shadow. You could be a, a monster. You could be a strong man. You could do different, different things as you look at your shadow. It was also fun running along with your shadow and then seeing if you could run past your shadow, if you could outrun your shadow, and different things like that. But as a kid, one thing that you learn by playing with your shadow is the evening came, the shadows began to elongate and they became longer on the ground, only signifying that night was coming. But now as an adult, I understand that there's more to the shadows than simply that night is coming. 
I believe that the Bible has given us signs to show us that the coming of Christ is drawing nearer than it's ever been before. And so today, we're going to take our Bibles and we're going to look at nine signs that point to the fact that Christ is returning and coming. And we're going to find those signs in Matthew chapter 24, beginning in verse 1, as we look at the signs of Christ's return together. The signs of Christ's return. I think this is an exciting message for the times that we live in and for all of us that love the Lord Jesus Christ to think about our Savior that is coming for us. I think it ought to make us uh, shout and become shouting Baptists today of thinking about, man, our Savior that is coming back. Notice the setting in Matthew chapter 24, sometimes called the Olivet Discourse. Jesus came out from the temple and was going away with the disciples, came up to a point out of the temple building to him. And he answered and said to them, Do you not see all these things? And truly I say to you, not one stone here will be left upon another, which will not be torn down. And in verse 3, he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, and the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And Jesus answered and said to them, See to it that no one misleads you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and I and will mislead many. And you will be hearing of wars and rumors of war. See that you're not frightened. Notice the word frightened. See that you're not frightened for those things must take place, but that is not yet the end. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and various places there will be famines and earthquakes, but all these things are merely the beginning of the birth pains. Then they will deliver you to tribulation and will kill you, and you will be hated by all the nations on account of my name. And at that time, many will fall away and will deliver up one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and will mislead many. And because lawlessness is increased, most people's love will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end, he shall be saved. That's an interesting verse. Verse 13 is not saying that if you just grit your teeth and you fight through it, then the Lord will save you. What it is saying is, that if you are truly a believer in Christ Jesus, that you will endure to the very end, verse 14. And the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness to all the nations, and then the end shall come. Verse 14, just for a moment, is amazing what is happening all over the world right now. Even in this COVID situation that I am visiting with a, uh, a young pastor I was writing to this morning, um, and they are even meeting when they're saying you can't meet. Man, the church is gathered around. The missionaries are telling us what just unbelievable events that are occurring around the world as people are being reached like no other time. And as we go out as a church, we take these little uh, solar power gospels that go out and people can listen to the the gospel in their own language. And man, it is an exciting what is happening. And then pick up with me in verse 15. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken through Daniel, the prophet standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. Understand what? That Christ is coming back. The disciples, they were just in awe of the temple. I mean, these were just good old country folk. You know what I mean? Man, they didn't get around to Jerusalem that often. And now they're in Jerusalem with Jesus, and they had the time just to take it all in and, and to enjoy the beauty of, of the temple and the beauty of that area. And as they were taking it all in, Jesus said some incredible words to them. You understand that the temple rested on 35 acres we're not talking about a, a, a small piece of land. It, it rested on 35 acres. There was a, 
the Holy of Holies and the holy place, but there was the courtyards, the courtyards for the Gentiles, for the Jews, for the women. They were retaining walls. It was an incredible uh, peace to look at as it was a place of worship. But Jesus says to them that this temple that you admire, it's going to be destroyed. I want you to grasp the magnitude of the temple. One writer said the temple was a formable place. Some of the stones used in constructing it were 40 feet long and, and 20 feet high and 12 feet wide. And some individual stones were as long as 80 feet in length. But Jesus turned to the disciples and said, hey, I want you to know that everything that you see here is going to be destroyed. And they began to wonder, how could that ever happen? How could that ever happen? How could this magnificent building and all of its structures ever be destroyed? But what we do know, in just a few years, in 70 AD, Titus rode in as the, the commander of the general of the army of Rome and destroyed it all. And we find that Josephus said, after the destruction, he said it this way. He said, it was completely destroyed. You could not tell that the city was even inhabited. But Jesus travels from the temple. And he makes that journey down the Kidron Valley up to the Mount of Olives. And many of you have been to the Mount of Olives. And some of you are, are seeking to go with us in March. It is the most incredible view you could ever imagine. You're up on the Mount of Olives. And Jesus' disciples are now looking back down upon the temple. And it is one of the most incredible views you ever see. And, and Jesus' disciples are there. And as they were looking at this incredible sight, they asked him three questions. Three questions they wanted to know and understand. First of all, it says, tell us when these things will happen. Man, they wanted to know, when, when are these things, the destruction of the temple, when, when is that going to happen? The second question was, what will be the sign of your coming? And when are you going to come and establish your kingdom? Is it today? Is it tomorrow? Man, we're ready. When is it going to come? And then when will that day be when the end of the age will come? The first question they asked is, tell us when these things will happen. And they want to know about the temple. Man, how, how can the temple be destroyed? When it, what is it going to be like? When is it going to happen? And Jesus tells them the answer to that in Luke 21, verse 20. And following, it says, But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by the armies, then recognize that the desolation has happened. Then those who are in Judea flee to the mountains and let those that are in the midst of the city depart because why? Don't go back because the Romans are here. And let those who are in the country do not enter the city because these are the days of vengeance in order that all things which are written may be fulfilled. But woe to those who are with child and those who nurse the babes in those days for there will be a great distress upon the land and the wrath of his people. Listen to this verse, verse 24. And they will fall by the edge of the sword and will be led captive into the nations. And Jerusalem will be trampled under their feet by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. That's an interesting place, the word, the Gentiles be fulfilled. We're living in the times of the Gentiles. According to Scripture, when did that begin? It began in 586 B.C. with the destruction of the first temple. And it will last the times of the Gentiles all the way until Jesus establishes his earthly kingdom from Jerusalem again. And so Jesus said, listen, that time is coming. The city is going to be surrounded. It's going to be destroyed. It's coming. But the second question they wanted to know is that when are you going to establish your kingdom? Jesus, man, we wanted to know when you're going to establish it. When are you coming? They use the words, the Greek word, parousia. When are you going to come and establish your kingdom? They were thinking that the kingdom was going to be established by Jesus, that at any time, any moment, any day, he's going to rise up and establish his kingdom. And man, they were excited. The Jews wanted someone to establish the kingdom again and drive out the Romans. And they were asking the questions, and Jesus began to describe what the kingdom will look like, what's going to happen in the kingdom. Not now, later it's going to occur. And then the third question, 
What are the signs? What are the signs that we might know that, that you are coming again? What are the signs that point to the fact that you are coming? Lord, tell us what the signs are. And we see, beginning in verse uh, 4 through verse 15, he begins to give us a litany of the signs. Now, I understand when we read this chapter, the signs that he's talking about are the signs that are occurring in the, in the tribulation period. The tribulation period occurs after the rapture. That's what you and I are waiting on. The rapture of the Lord, the catching up of the church described in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, beginning with verse 13 through verse 18. That's what we are waiting for. But as we see these signs that are going to be full-blown in the tribulation, I want you to understand that we are already seeing those signs, the shadows beginning to fall upon the face of the earth, only indicating to us today what? Man, our departure from this place could be very, very soon. I'm not setting a date, a time, but I'm anxious and believing it could come any day that our Lord would come for the church. And so what does these tell us about these signs? First of all, beginning in verse 4 and 5, it's the signs of deception. Signs of deception. Notice he said, see, or some translation says, take heed. Watch out. There are going to be many that will come and say that I am the Christ. I am the Messiah. Follow me. And we find there are that deception all over the world today. That people are ready to follow someone that would bring about peace and give answers to the world. Listen carefully to what I'm saying. I'm not making a comparison that he is, but it's a picture of what will happen. Do you remember when President Barack Obama, before he became president, was running for president? It was very interesting. He did a lot of his campaigning, not here, but overseas. You remember that? And they said, man, it was like a rock star. As he would show up, there would be crowds that were incredible gathering around him. For people around the world are hungry for someone to bring about answers and peace and fulfillment. And Jesus said, man, there's going to be many that will come. We find across the world there are always these reports of somebody saying that I'm the Christ. I'm the Messiah. I have come. Follow me. Look at the cults and the old cults that are in the world today, all pointing to that fact. And Jesus said in verse 23 that if anyone says to you, behold, here is the Christ or there he is, do not believe them. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and will show great signs and wonders as to be lead many is possible, even the elect. Listen to what he said. He said, man, many will be caught up in that. But he said it would even deceive, if possible, the elect. But he's saying, look, the elect cannot be deceived because you know you have the Spirit of Christ in you. You know what is true. And he said, man, you're not going to get caught up in this. And he said, just be aware. One of the shadows that is going to come full-blown in the tribulation we're seeing now is that people are hungry for a charismatic leader. People are hungry for someone to get us out of this mess that we're in. Uh, and they're looking for it. And so we find that there will be that charismatic lever will come, but deception will follow after it. And it will become full-blown in whom the Antichrist will come. But there's a second sign that he gives us. There's going to be disturbance among the nations, verse 6 and 7. Man, there will be talk of wars and rumors of wars. And those talks of wars and rumors of wars will just continue to grow, continue to grow, continue to happen in our world around us. And we find in Zechariah, he says, Behold, a day is coming for the Lord when the spoil will be taken from you and you'll be divided among you. For I will gather the nations against Jerusalem for battle, and the city will be captured, the horses plundered, and the women ravished, and half of the city will be uh, exiled, but the rest of the people will not be cut off from the city. Then the Lord will go forth and fight against the nations when he fights on that day of battle. We find that the world is growing in this restlessness and, and coalitions are, are forming. And we find it's going to form until that day that the world uh, comes against Jerusalem and Israel, but the Lord will intervene and win that battle, the battle of Armageddon, the great 
in of all battles. It is estimated today that there's been over one billion people killed since the beginning of civilization in wars and battles. But listen to what's happening today, the hot topics that we find. Israel and Gaza in conflict. The U.S. departure from Afghanistan and what is happening there. Russia and the Ukraine. Uh, the Syrian civil war that is still playing out. And China is now declaring that the China Sea is theirs. And anybody that enters that area must answer to China. And so we see these areas of conflict that is happening around the world. And these kinds of conflicts will continue to increase, only showing us the time of Christ's return. Number three, notice in verse seven, disturbing events. During the time of the tribulation, there's going to be some real disturbing events. Notice verse seven. And in various places, there will be famines and earthquakes. And in Luke chapter 21, verse 11, it even includes pestilence. And I think what you could put disease related to pestilence in it. And see, we are facing those things today. The, the shadows of those things are on the world today. I want you to listen just for a moment of these fascinating, sad statistics about earthquakes. Just last month, August 15th, uh, 2021, 1,940 people died in Haiti. April 25th, 2015, more than 8,000 died in Nepal. August 3rd, 2014, 700 died in China. September 24th, 2013, 825 in Pakistan. 2011, 18,000 died or missing in Japan. 2010, 700 died in Chile. Uh, we find in 2010, 316,000 died in Haiti. Uh, 2009, 1,100 died in Indonesia. 2008, nearly 90,000 died in China. 2007, 500 died in Peru. 2006, 5,700 died in Indonesia. 80,000 died in 05 in Pakistan. And on and on and on we could go about these earthquakes and, and what is happening. But Luke 21, 11 says, and there will be great earthquakes in various places and plagues and famines, and there will be terrors and great signs from the heavens. There will also be famines that will come. Do you realize that today, one in eight people on earth go to bed hungry, and 1.5 million children each year die of hunger? I'm simply pointing out that we are seeing the shadows of what is going to be full-blown in the tribulation, those shadows are ever increasing in our world today, reminding us of Christ's coming. In Revelation chapter 8, 7, it says, There sounded and there came hail and fire mixed with blood, and there were thrown to the earth. A third of the earth was burned up, and a third of the trees were burned up, and all the grass and the trees were burned up. We'll add, we'll add to the plagues and to the misery of what's going on the earth. Also, Revelation 16, 2 through 3 talks about, so the first angel went and poured out his bow upon the earth, and it became lonesome and malignant sores on people, and the mark of the beast who they worshiped their image. And the second angel poured out a bow into the sea, and it became blood like dead man, and every living thing in the sea died, simply referring to the fact that this age is going to be full of disease, earthquakes, Famine, plagues are going to rule the world. Number four, a determined effort to silence believers. Over the last four or five decades, we have seen the silencing of believers more and more. Christians are becoming more marginalized. And today, if you stood up in your school if you stood up in your civic club and said, I'm a Christian, I'm a born-again believer, what benefit is that to you? There's no benefits to that anymore in America to say, I am a believer in Christ. No benefits at all. At one time, you would be recognized. At one time, it would give you an acceptance. But today, if you are saying that I am a believer, 
I'm telling you, it doesn't give any benefits in America anymore. If you claim to stand for the truths revealed in the Bible, you'll be labeled as a homophobic, narrow-minded bigot, a right-wing fundamentalist. We are a nation that is killing our own children, promoting legalized, perverted lifestyle and drugs, and the voice of biblically-minded people have become more marginalized year by year. In our world today, we find that those who have and proclaim the name of Christ, uh, about a hundred a month are martyred around the world. John Allen in his book, Global War, said this, the truth is two-thirds of the 2.3 billion Christians in the world today live in what he calls a dangerous neighborhood. And we're going to find that the persecution of believers will continue on and on ago. And the marginalizing of, of believers in America will continue to happen. In Revelation chapter 6, verse 10 and 11, it says, And they cried out with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, will you refrain from judging and avenging, listen, our blood on those who dwell upon the earth? And there's going to be given to each of them a white robe. And they were told that they should rest for a little while longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brethren that were killed, even as they have been, would be completed. Revelation chapter 7, uh, 9 and 10 said, After these things I looked, and behold, there was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation. And the tribes and people and tongues were standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, and palm branches were in their hands. And they cry out with a loud voice saying, Salvation to our God who sits upon the throne and the Lamb. A time is coming when there's going to be worldwide hatred for Jews and for believers as well in Jesus Christ. And we are seeing there's no benefit in America today for you proclaiming to be a believer in Jesus Christ. And then we're going to see the desertion among those who claim to be believers. Look in verse 10. And at that time, many will fall away and will deliver it up one another and hate one another. There's going to be an apostate happening that people will fall away. And people are discouraged when they see that. They say, man, they, they were once among us. They were once a Sunday school teacher. They were once a deacon. I mean, they look like us. But understand this, the Bible said, they were never really of us. They were never were born again, even though they had the right words for a time, had said the right things, but there's going to be a falling away from the church, a falling away from those who claim to know Christ. We see it in our day, don't we? Listen to these names. Maybe some will be familiar, maybe others won't. But Marty Sampson, a worship music leader who writes music for Hillsong, has denounced his faith, write some of the most popular Christian songs of our day, has come out and said, man, I, I'm not a follower of Christ. And you say, man, how could that happen? Well, he never was. He's an apostate. Joshua Harris, some of you have his books in your own library. The author of the best-selling book that came out, I Kiss Dating Goodbye, said that he's no longer a Christian. Dave Gass, mega church pastor, former pastor of Grace Family Fellowship in Pleasant Hills, Missouri, said this. After 40 years of being a devout follower, 20 of those being an evangelical pastor, I'm walking away from the faith, even though this has been a massive bomb dropped in my life. It has been decades in the making. Paul Maxwell, a former writer for Desiring God writes, the author of the book, uh, Trauma, the Doctrine, he said he declares that he's no longer a Christian. And you're going to see that more and more in churches and in those that have platforms that are going to walk away. But my friend, it's only the sign of the time. It's only a shadow that's pointing to the return of Christ. So, so don't let it discourage and rock your faith. Only let it make it stronger of knowing that Christ said these things will come about. And then there will be deceitful prophets 
You see that in verse 11. Many false prophets will rise and lead, mislead many. Number seven, de digression in society. And it becomes lawlessness. Notice it says in verse 12, is increased. And most people's love will grow cold. How would you like to live in that time when people said, man, I shake off any law, any restraints, even the law of conscience that Christ has given all of us in our lives that I sear that. I sear that, and no longer do I have any restraints in my life. I just do what I want to do. How would you like to live in a society like that? Could you imagine living at a time like that? Oh, I can. Because we live today with road rage, abduction of children, sex trafficking, abortion, drive-by shootings, and the list goes on and on and on. And we are seeing the shadows of that today. Number eight, the development of super evangelists. As I said, man, the gospel is going out all over the world in unbelievable means and unbelievable ways right now. But there's going to rise this unbelievable gospel that's going to spread all over the world. Notice what it says in verse 14, the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached into the whole world for a witness to all the nations. And then, what? Now I shall come. How will that happen? What's going to happen by people like us that board planes and go to those places in the 1040 window where people are still waiting for the first time to hear about Christ? But in the tribulation, we find it's going to happen three ways. First, there will be believers, or four ways if we count the believers that are alive in there. They'll continue to share their faith even though it means their life. I remember just not too long ago, many years ago, Godwin called me from India. And he said, Pastor, in that British accent, he said, Pastor, pray for us. He said, why people are meeting in the churches, they're locking the doors and burning the people that are in their churches and killing them. He said, they're going to their homes and killing the people there. And many of the believers have fled out into the jungle. And he said, it's monsoon season. And he said, I went to meet those believers. And I said, God won. Man, what would you say to people that have lost loved ones and, and that have had people die and their churches destroyed? What would you say to them? He said, I said this, go back. It doesn't matter whether you live or die. You've got to go back and share the gospel with the people. And so we're going to find during the tribulation there's going to be that kind of spirit that believers are saying, I'll, I'll give my life for the gospel. But second, there'll be 144,000, not Jehovah Witnesses. Listen, not Jehovah Witnesses. There'll be 144,000 Jewish evangelists. By the way, I had a mechanic that was a Jehovah Witness one time. And I was standing over him while he's looking at my car, acting like I knew what I was looking at, but I didn't. And I said, let me ask you, how do you know if you're a hundred, one of the elect, if you're one of the 144,000, because as a Jehovah Witness, I, I would want to know that. Man, I would want to know that I'm the elect. And he said, I don't know. I said, you don't know. Wouldn't you want to know? I mean, you're just going to have to wait till the end of time to find out if you're going to go to heaven. You don't know. These 144,000 are Jewish evangelists, and they're going to be scattered around the world taking the gospel. Then, then, there's going to be an angel of the Lord. You see God's mercy. An angel of the Lord, we find in Revelation, is going to circumvent the world. And this angel is going to be proclaiming the gospel of the Lord. You see God's mercy. Man, he wants everybody to hear. He wants everybody to know. And there's going to be this mass explosion of evangelism. And man, we are seeing it played out right before our very eyes. And then number nine, the last one that he gives, is the dishonoring of the temple. He calls it the abomination of desolation. We find that in Daniel in three places. In Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. Daniel chapter 11, verse 31. Daniel 12, verse 11. The abomination and the desolation occurs at the halfway point in the tribulation, at the three-and-a-half-year mark. We find, as I said earlier, the world is waiting for this charismatic personality. Well, they'll find one in the Antichrist. He'll come saying, I believe out of the 
formation of the old Roman Empire. And he'll come promising peace to the world. And he'll set up a peace agreement with Israel. And Israel will say, man, we want peace. And in the middle of the three and a half years, the Antichrist will break that peace treaty with Israel. The Jews will be hunted down. Christians will be hunted down. And the Antichrist will set him up, the abomination will set himself up in the temple in Jerusalem saying, worship me. Worship me. We find right now in Israel, uh, they are gathering everything they need to build the temple again. They're ready. They're ready to rebuild the temple again. There's that dispute about the Temple Mount where the Muslims hold it right now. God can solve that. An earthquake, something else that might occur, but the Jews are ready and they will build the temple again and then the Antichrist will take his place. Nine signs that we are seeing the foreshadow and the lengthening of those signs now that point to the fact that we could be that very generation that sees Jesus Christ come back. Nine signs. And you say, so what? So what? I, I read this this week. So what? I think there are five so what's. The first one is this. As you see the shadows growing which will be full-blown the tribulation, you ought to say that our redemption is drawing nigh. You ought to keep one eye looking towards the heavens and believing that today could be the day that Christ comes. I'm talking about a healthy anticipation. I'm not saying go and sell everything that you have and move to the mountaintop somewhere and just sit and wait. No, 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 no. I'm just saying that we ought to live the life that God has called us. But we don't live with one eye looking towards the heaven, believing and anticipating, man, today could be the day because we see the shadows that are being cast on the world today. The second thing is you see the shadows growing, it ought to make you say, I want to live a life that matters for Christ. Listen, man, I'm amazed at people that say, I ought to get back in church. Man, I, I ought to really get after it. I ought to really, no, listen, I'm telling you, as my church, man, today is the day that you ought to live full-blown for Jesus Christ. Man, there's no tomorrow. There's more that I'll read my Bible tomorrow. I'll, I'll get faithful tomorrow. I'll get in a degree. I'll, I'll do all that. No, listen, I'm telling you, now. You ought to see the shadows. That ought to motivate you to say, man, I, I want a life that matters for Christ today. Man, I want to live to the fullest today, not that you live with the regrets and said, why didn't I? Why didn't I do more? Why didn't I? No, 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 no. Man, live for him fully today. Make your life count for Christ. You'll never be sorry for that. When you hear that sound of the midnight cry, man, you won't be sorry that you made a life that mattered for Christ but the third thing, you see the shadows grow. Don't become fearful. Man, don't become fearful. Become hopeful. Man, when you see the plagues and the earthquakes and the desolation and, and when you see the persecution of the saints and when you see all these crazy things that are happening around the world, man, don't become fearful. Man, become hopeful. Man, Christ, he's coming, amen? Amen. Man, this is not the time for us as believers to be going around, you know, wringing our hands together and saying, oh my, you know, man, these are dreadful times. They are. I, I agree. But man, it doesn't scare us. It makes us hopeful for what is coming for us, that Christ is coming back. Somebody say amen. Man, no fear. Don't live in fear. Man, live in the hope of Jesus Christ. But as you see the signs, number four, of the shadows, it ought to give you a greater urgency to share Christ with somebody. Now listen, I'm telling you what I believe. I'm not the only one that believes this. People will say all the time, man, if I miss out on the coming of the Lord and, and I'm left in the tribulation, that's okay. Because I will receive Christ's sin. I'll, I'll give my life to Christ. 
And my answer to that is, man, that's foolish. If you won't come to Christ now, when the Holy Spirit is moving, Man, when there are people that will applaud and celebrate you coming to Christ, why do you think, literally, when all hell is poured out upon this earth, that you will want to receive Christ in? Deception, false Christ, false prophets, false messiahs. Uh-uh. And even with the angels, 144,000, the two witnesses of Moses and Elijah, and I think I forgot to mention them, the two witnesses of Moses and Elijah, people will still say no to Christ. But I'm telling you, there's, a, there's some that are ready. And now's the time to share. To the people you ride the bus with, the people you sit in school with, the people that you work with, the people that you know that live across the street, now is the time to share. Because one day, it's going to be too late for Christ. The last one. When you see those shadows coming, and if you haven't received Christ for yourself, I'm telling you, today's the day of salvation. Why would you wait? Why would you wait? As I said, one day it's going to be too late. If you already heard the gospel message and you said no today, I believe if Christ would come tomorrow, man, it seals your faith for all eternity. I believe that. Man, I believe that. And so today, if you're here without Christ and you see these shadows growing and elongating, man, you ought to be the first one down the aisle running and said, man, today... I'm giving my life to Jesus Christ. I'm giving my life to Christ. I want to ask you, can you see the shadows? Man, can you see the shadows? Oh, they're growing. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Your word that prepares us for that day in which you're going to come for the church. But it prepares us to understand what it's going to be like during the tribulation time. What a horrible time it will be as the Holy Spirit is restrained during that time. The persecution of believers will be unfathomable. If anyone does not take the mark of the beast, and then, Father, we find disease and earthquakes and plagues and suffering and lack of food and strange events in the heavens and the earth. But we are seeing that now. We are seeing some strange things that this generation has never witnessed before fires like we have never seen we've seen fires but not to this extent in California flooding death toll by the COVID new variants new strands maybe no end to it it only reminds us man that you're coming back for your church so let us be ready Let us be ready for that day. Let us see the signs and let us keep one eye turned towards heaven, believing that today could be that day when the Father says to the Son, today, go get my church. It's time. It's time.